Welcome everybody, my name's Maggie. I'm a community engagement librarian here. And um, this is a class about native seed propagation with Bill Daniels from Native Seed Communities. He's the program leader there, also a master gardener. And he's here representing the Indiana Native Plant Society. So I will go ahead and turn it over to him. Welcome. Thank you, Maggie, really appreciate it. And good morning, everyone. We may have a few others coming in. I think we had about 29 or had 29 sign up. So, uh, but it's a beautiful day out. Uh, the, the fair is going on, the Fourth Street activities are all happening today. But anyway, how many of you have ever uh, grown native plants from seeds? So we've got, okay, good, a few of you here. Uh, were you successful? Great, good, okay, well hopefully to do what? A few times. A few times, okay. Well, I'm, this, is, uh, this is something that I've been interested in. Well, I've been interested in native plants ever since I read Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home, about, I think about 11 years ago. And if you haven't read that book, I, I would highly recommend it. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about why native plants. I'm hoping you all are already familiar with that. Uh, we're really going to, going to focus in on growing these natives, these beautiful native plants from seed. And uh, so I've been doing this about six years. And uh, I, I do have a horticulture background from 14 to 31. I primarily worked in horticulture. And then I spent the rest of my career in uh, environmental health and safety, mainly uh, compliance and, and things of that nature. But when I retired, this is what I wanted to do. So since I'm retired, I get to do that and still in good health. So. Um, we do have a sign in. I think everybody knows that already that's here. Uh, if you're interested in the presentation, uh, as I've mentioned to a few of you, feel free to put presentation off to the side, and then I'll get that to you in some way. All right. So any questions before we get going? All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. OK, this is our agenda today, uh, need for native seed communities. Uh, what Native Seed Communities is. I'm the, the program leader for that, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, growing Native, native Seeds uh, process and information and resources about how to do this. We've got a lot of them on our Indiana Native Plant Society's website. All right, need for Native Seed Communities. Uh, back in January of 2021, I heard uh, Heather McCargo, who's the founder of the Wild Seed Project. Any of you heard of the Wild Seed Project? It's a marvelous program in Maine. And she was also the former head propagator for Garden in the Woods, which is a 45-acre native plant showcase outside of, outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And she's done other things. She's an architect, landscape architect, et cetera. But I had heard her say something like this similar in other YouTube videos that I'd seen. But in this video called, uh, I think it was uh, a grassroot plant, con uh, plant propagation. Grassroot native plant propagation was what it was. Our native plants are losing their place in our world. Our challenge is great. We need both professionals and amateurs growing our natives. So that, that first part of that, um, that quote, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that here in just a minute. But it, as far as the challenge is great, we need both professionals and amateurs. Even though I did it professionally for a while, I'm really a, an amateur at this. I, uh, I, I grew lots of flowers. <laughs> I grew flowers by the, the thousands and the hundred th hundreds of thousands and, uh, and so forth, and uh, did, did gardens and things of that nature uh, for uh, several of my jobs. Um, but it really struck me about not only do we need professionals, we also need us amateurs growing these native plants. And uh, let's, let's talk about this. So I don't know if you all are familiar with the state of the world's plants and fungi, but the, the uh, 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 Royal Botanic Gardens Q puts out this pretty major report every four years. And back in uh, 2020, they came, came out with this pretty dramatic headline, 40% of our native plants are at risk of, of extinction. And uh, this really wasn't a small 
report by any means. Over 210 researchers across 42 countries from 97 different organizations put this report together. And, uh, and so it's a, a pretty, pretty, pretty uh, major, major undertaking, research project. What is even more dramatic, though, is that in 2016, they did State of the World's Plants uh, and fun well, actually, at that time, they did separate it between plants and fungi. But anyway, for plants in 2016, it was 21%. So within four years, they deemed things had degraded so much that, that it was 40% in 20, uh, 2020. So I'm curious to see what's going to happen in 2024. Uh, as Alexander Ant Antonelli, uh, the royal, um, uh, the director of the Royal Botanic Gardens Q, um, the science, he said, a very worrying picture of risk and urgent need for action. And it's not surprising that if we are losing our plants at such a rapid, uh, rapid, uh, uh, rapid, uh, not process, but anyway, rapid state, uh, we, uh, we're going to be losing our animals. Uh, our plants are the foundation of our ecosystem. They are the base of our food webs. And I, I do acknowledge there are other things that are going on that are, are impacting our wildlife. Uh, but really, a, a major part of this are our plants. And thus, we're going to see such, such uh, reports as uh, whether it's the insect apocalypse, and I know you all have seen a lot of this. We're not seeing it enough, uh, how dramatic it really is. Uh, but um, uh, for instance, it, uh, the, uh, 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 the World Wildlife Fund comes out with a Living Planet Report. Are any of you familiar with that? Uh, but they, they look at uh, the, uh, how species are doing and, uh, and where they are in, in relation to their numbers. And, uh, and so since I was born in 1970, I was 13 at that time, they, it has degraded all the way to, uh, uh, they say 69% uh, less of, of those animals on our planet. Pretty, pretty wild, just wild. So need for native seed communities. We can do something about this. Uh, native seed communities was created about three or four years ago. Uh, we are part of the Indiana Native Plant Society, and we promote networks of native plant enthusiasts working together to regionally procure, process, and propagate native plant seeds. And we're doing this regionally uh, to increase the presence of these beautiful and ecologically appropriate native plants in all of our landscapes. And these are just some, some examples of local uh, up at the top left-hand corner, we're collecting uh, seeds out at one of the properties for Sycamore Land Trust. Uh, lower left-hand corner, uh, some of us are, are sowing those seeds, and I'm going to teach you the method today on how to sow those seeds, how, how we do it. Um, and then uh, MC Iris, I think that might be an MC Iris, but the plant sale is coming up uh, in just a couple of weeks. Uh, actually, next weekend, and uh, and we're uh, potting up seedlings that we had grown from seeds, and then of course, uh, well, I shouldn't say of course, but this is the uh, the MC Iris sale from looking above uh, last year. The key objective is to expand access to seed-grown native plants in all of our landscapes, and to be able to do that. One of the main things is what we're doing here today, demystify growing native plants from seed, support groups of trained volunteers working together to regionally acquire, process, and propagate these native plants, native plant seeds, provide information and guidance on how to free up and prepare land for rewilding, encourage and facilitate native plant seed swaps, libraries, uh, the sharing of those, uh, and then to be able to share, encourage the sharing of those plants that have been grown from seed, like we, we've done at MC Iris. And, and we, we did a Sycamore Land Trust. We've got a, a conservation nursery there that we started a few years ago. And we did have a sale last spring. But most of those plants are going out into the property, uh, into the properties. 
Uh, I mentioned Doug Tallamy at the beginning, and he made this quote right after talking about the need for clearing some space for our native plants, uh, because we've got a lot of invasives out, out there. Uh, but he said, it is not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It is the absence of native plants. So we need more native plants out there. And, uh, and so this is one way to do it. Why grow from seed? Support restoration efforts. We have a great need there to not only free up land, get rid of our, our, land, our, uh, our grass uh, lawns. Um, also, we need to think about what we eat uh, because our diets affect uh, the kind of how much land we use for, for, uh, for plants. Uh, more plants to capture and store carbon. Uh, basically, a plant is a carbon entity, and it pulls down uh, about the same amount of weight in carbon dioxide as what the plant is. So, um, so uh, for instance, a tree, uh, I, I've heard that the average weight of a tree is about a, about a ton. And uh, this is globally, average weight of a tree, about a ton. So you're pulling down about a, a ton of carbon dioxide. Uh, and then you've got the, the root system, you've got everything that goes into the soil, and then it can be as much as a, a ton and a half more. So uh, instead of cutting down trees, we need to be thinking about where we can put trees, where we can put, uh, we've got some tree stuff we talk about. Granted, we're talking a lot about uh, today the more herbaceous stuff, but it, we need to store more carbon, and this carbon capture stuff and everything, uh, I don't, uh, it's going to be difficult to pull down what we need to pull down with that uh, kind of technology. We need trees uh, to create a closer connection with our native plants. Uh, you can grow more plants for pollinator nutrition and energy conservation. There is a, a bee lab, the, the UC Urban Bee Lab out in, uh, out in Berkeley. And uh, they've done a lot of research on how much nutrition uh, do, the, uh, do our bees need, um, butterflies and so forth, and really focusing in on the bees of Urban Bee Lab. Uh, they found that it's important to have about, about a, a meter, maybe this is a meter, a meter by meter square, a meter square uh, area of, of, of one species. And the reason for that is a lot of our bees are what are called, uh, they, they have a, a characteristic, a practice of floral constancy. They, they go to one species, that, so they fly out, they collect one species, and they come back. They collect from one species and then come back. So to make it worth their while, it's better to have more than one plant. One plant's important, uh, but it'd be great if we have uh, bigger blocks. And uh, so you can think of a, 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 a yard by yard. Uh, so, uh, so growing native plants from seed, as, you, as you'll see, we can grow lots of plants very, very efficiently that way. Desire for locally adapted native plants. Uh, some of you may realize some of the issues there, but most of the native plants that we, we would buy from a big box, big box store are um, you, you buy a species, let's say, of milkweed. Many of those, most of those are grown through tissue culture. So we are growing the same plant, in essence, all over the eastern part of the United States. And uh, many of those are cultivars. They're selected varieties. Uh, so this way, you have an opportunity to collect a genetically, or to grow, to collect, and then grow a genetically uh, indiv individual plant, or a plant that's, it's its own, uh, it has its own genetics. Uh, more plants for the buck, and just for the joy of it. And by the way, if anybody has any questions, just, uh, just pipe up, okay? All right, so a lot of the inspiration about uh, uh, growing native plants from seed, but especially this, this method, came from these three places for me. Uh, the, uh, uh, 
probably about seven years ago, I was traveling to Raleigh Durham, uh, through Raleigh Durham Airport, and I went over to Virginia, got done a little bit early for this project, came back through the evening before my flight, which was the next day out uh, in the afternoon, and I was able to go to the North Carolina Botanic Garden. And um, I, I was just walking around the, the, the facilities, and I got to the back, and they had their growing grounds area. And I asked a docent what those boxes were for. And he kind of explained the process we're, we're talking about right now, that they're, they're, um, they're, overwin they're overwintered seeds, so they, they go through the winter uh, so that uh, it will trigger their germination for the spring. And so and this was real early in the spring. Uh, I think there were still plants in there, but anyway, I took a picture of it. Uh, later on, I took a course about maybe three or four years ago from, from uh, uh, the Sami Farm Nursery. And Native Plant Trust is, uh, uh, is a, a huge organization. They used to be the, the New England Wildflower Society. And uh, now they're called Native Plant Trust. But they've got a, uh, a, 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 a nursery a native plant nursery, which is Nasami Farm Nursery. And so I took a, a, a course uh, from, from their head propagator, and, and she talked about these boxes and the germination boxes or stations. And then, um, actually, before that, I ran into Heather McCargo's works via, um, primarily via uh, YouTube and the Wild Seed Project. So what I'm showing you now, is basically right from Heather McCargo and, and her organization. Okay, so first off, uh, by the way, I've got some flyers over here that uh, the Wild Seed Project has allowed us to use, and, uh, and so please uh, do take one. Um, it uh, just shows the circular way about what we're doing today. Um, so anyway, we need to get some seed. You can purchase it, of course. Uh, you can get it from friends or from seed swaps. We do have a seed swap, excuse me, coming up uh, at our Indiana Native Plant Society's uh, annual convention, and it is here. So, and if you want to participate and, and um, uh, come to the convention, anybody going to go to it? No? It is October the 28th. I'm not sure who said that, but yeah, October the 28th. Yeah, okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, and you can find that online. But if you are coming, these are the kind of jars and containers we'd like the seeds to be in if you're going to participate in the seed swap. That'll get you the first opportunity um, that, to go in and, and check out the seeds. I think last year we had 70 species and uh, I think uh, over 120 people. Uh, contributed so pretty pretty major and it's here in Bloomington um, and, and then collect your own okay so today I'm really going to be since we're right in the height of collection season I'm going to primarily be talking about collecting okay and if you have questions though about any of the other means just give me a yell all right collecting just some of the seeds that we've collected over the last, last few years. Okay, a, little, a few rules, as well as some of the preparation you need to do. Uh, first off, you need to know what you're collecting. It's, uh, and you really should know the scientific name, uh, the genus, species. And there are lots of resources out there. The, um, uh, the naturalist at uh, Monroe, uh, Monroe Lake, uh, oh, I can't think of her name right now. But anyway, she does a, a monthly uh, program, which is just excellent, just terrific on identifying and your, your native plants out there. Uh, a good guide is Newcombs, but there are a lot of other good guides. So really make sure, uh, I'm starting at the left-hand corner over there. Um, so. Um, just make sure you know what you're collecting. And another excellent resource, and I think this is out of print right now, but 
On our website, we have the digital version that you can access, Lake County Seed Collection Guide. And um, the Kelly Schultz and Dale Shields, uh, they just do marvelous. And one of the, uh, it, it's probably hard for you to see, but, but one of the terrific things about this is you can kind of see it in the image of the guide, uh, but they show you what the seed looks like. And that's not always clear when you go up to a, a, a fruiting plant or a, a plant that's got seed pods, what part of this is the seed? Uh, and so they, they show you all that, they show you what it looks like when it's ready to be collected, a few notes as well. There are other resources uh, to do that, but this is an exceptional one. Um, we, in fact, uh, for uh, Native Seed Communities, we have an annual, uh, annual a, a monthly presentation on, uh, on Zoom, and uh, we do put all of these onto YouTube as well as our Trello board. Um, we had somebody from Lake County Seed Collection Guide talk uh, just uh, last week. All right, so know what you're collecting, <clears throat> uh, what part is the seed, and then, uh, and then uh, um, uh, make sure that what you're collecting isn't, a, uh, uh, isn't something that's, that's rare and threatened. Even if it's on your property, you want to be, uh, it, that would be an exciting thing that you actually have it on your property and it's growing there. It'd be better to protect it than to collect seed from it and, and, uh, and grow it out and let it, let it do its thing. But anyway, uh, we do have some rare uh, uh, endangered plants out there. Be aware of that. Uh, the upper right hand, I mean upper top uh, at the right, uh, seeds should never be wild collected and from your except from your personal property under the guidance of a botanist for a specific project or with permission of a private landowner. Okay. Uh, what can be collected at state parks? A lot of times people ask me this question and it's really not very much. <laughs> Okay, especially when it comes to our herbaceous, our, our um, non-woody plants. So what you can collect, you can collect greens all you want, but they have to be asparagus, wild asparagus, dandelion, mustard, uh, plantain, and poke. You can collect poke. Poke is, uh, it is a native, but, but anyway. Uh, so it's, it's very limited, uh, and, and that means you don't collect spring wildflower, seeds, ramp, onions, uh, and any other plant not mentioned up there. A lot of people, they're surprised by this, but it's important since so many of us go to these, these parks and the properties that we keep them in, a, in a, a, a wild state as much as possible. You can collect, though, uh, berries uh, and uh, uh, mushrooms, and I can't really read it from here, but anyway, you can collect uh, nuts, berries, and mushrooms. That's basically it. And many of you already knew that. Are any of you wild uh, in foragers? Foragers in here? No? Okay. <clears throat> oh, and then observe the 5% rule. Now, uh, different organizations inc encourage you not to do, collect more than 20% of the seed in a population. Uh, it could be one collect from one plant, the five that you see, or, or whatever. And uh, our state botanist, uh, Scott Namisnik, he would really rather, uh, if you're not part of a specific project and being engaged, if you are collecting from a wild land, especially uh, if it's a, uh, uh, some special project, uh, really he wants to keep it to 5%. Anyway, but a lot of them say 20%. Some organizations, some states uh, say 10%, but he's, he's extra conservative. Now, if it's your own property, um, then, you know, that's, that's you, uh, that, that's, you know, uh, you can do what you want on your own property, uh, but, but it, it's still, you want to keep those plants even on your own property. As far as gardens, then uh, it would be, Similar, um, you, it, some, seed, some plants reseed really well, uh, and you, you get the feel for that when you're, uh, you're doing gardening. All right, there, there's, there are various pieces of equipment that can come in handy. Uh, gloves, I've 
I got them here. All right, I've got a lot of this stuff up here. Gloves are good for like pokey things like uh, cone heads. This is just basic echinacea here. Um, you can, uh, I, I did want to show you all this. This is a, a rose uh, uh, cutter. Um, and uh, let me see if I've got it on the right side. Okay, so, so it just grabs, grabs the stem, and then you can, and then you can drop it right into your bag or whatever. That's kind of cool, I think. Uh, just holds on to it, okay? And that way, then you've got your hand free to, to do other stuff. Uh, you need uh, something to collect in. We've got bags, we've got plastic uh, bags. Uh, you need a marker. A marker is okay for this kind of work. I don't recommend a Sharpie for any, any of your pots or anything because they do not last. They don't even last the summer. Uh, so, um, uh, I, you know, and a rolling pin, some of the harder heads uh, can be uh, uh, like, uh, uh, like a pinstamen beak, a uh, little seed pod and so forth. Uh, you may want to use uh, needle nose pair of pliers. I usually don't. Uh, for nuts and, and some of the fruits, but primarily nuts, this uh, uh, nut weasel, any of you ever use one of those? Or Those are, yeah, those are really handy. Uh, I was helping out in an animal sanctuary one time, and, and the pot bellied pigs liked uh, hickory nuts. And so they sent me out picking up hickory nuts with these, and they were really, really good. Um, these little uh, organza bags, uh, some, some of our seeds, and we're not going to get into a huge amount of detail about that, but some of our seeds are what are called ballistic, and they're really the only type of seed I don't have up here because they, when they're ripe, they throw. Uh, the uh, uh, wild, uh, wild uh, uh, petunia, I don't know if you've ever uh, had seen wild petunias, uh, and many other plants are... are uh, uh, seeds, they do throw them, and there's, there's some neat stuff online uh, showing that. But those bags come in really handy. I, I especially use those for the, the wood poppy or the celandine poppies uh, because once the pods open up, uh, they, just tr they just open up and they drop the seeds. So they're very difficult to catch them when they're ripe, and that's perfect to do that. Now you need to keep going back uh, to... Uh, um, uh, you know, daily, practically, to catch them uh, because those uh, seeds don't like to be dried out. Uh, just some of the other tools up here. Uh, I, I've shown you some really, uh, like, these are expensive right here. Uh, these are just sieves, and they were uh, a, a, a herb company put these together, and, and I, uh, I could have bought a boat with them. My dad had boats. I've got I've got seed equipment, <laughs> equipment, but uh, but anyway, um, but really, I use I use this about as much as anything, and all they are 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 colanders that uh, uh, you can uh, uh, yeah, and they're graduated. So these kind of things I got these from Goodwill. Most of my stuff, a lot of my stuff, I I. I go to Goodwill several times uh, uh, a year and, and pick up some stuff. Okay. All right, uh, some of the resources. I've already shown you the Lake County Seed Collection Guide. Another one is Prairie Moon Nursery. They, not only can you buy some high quality seeds there, they, um, and, and if you're curious where the seeds come from, they will tell you where those seeds came from, and they're within the Midwest. More, more often than not, they're more above us. Uh, but uh, but uh, Prairie Moon Nursery has a lot of information, and I believe, I believe Maggie, you were mentioning you had the germination codes over there. Uh, there, there was one. I think maybe someone had. Oh, it, but okay. That's okay. Oh, I think okay. their um, their internet. The, yeah. the website has the same information. Yeah, they, they've got them yeah. all on there, but it gives you an idea. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that here right now. Um, so 
Well, another thing you'd like to know is how do you need to, to treat this seed so that you get that germination going? What does it need? And our native plants, they, they grew up here. So they're very used to having, uh, uh, they, they grew up with our winters, okay? That's one thing. They grew up with our summers. And so our seeds have, have adapted to, to uh, well, they've, they've, they've got different germination uh, mechanisms. And so Prairie Moon Nursery, these are their germination codes. So if you buy some seeds, you'll see A or you'll see C, 60 or C90, et cetera. So, um, so anyway, uh, but other organizations, in, ca in, in fact, uh, another great resource here is uh, uh, Bill Kalina's, William Kalina's book on growing and propagating native plants from seed. He's got his germination codes in there. They look like those. Um, uh, Wild Seed Project does too, et cetera. These are prairie moon nurseries. They work really well. You can go online, search uh, a, a, a specific uh, species, and it will tell you how they, how they spark that germination. Uh, I highlighted three of those, and you could probably highlight others, but if you use this method that we're using, uh, that I'm really getting ready to get into, uh, you don't have to worry about those. You don't have to worry about whether they need treatment or not. Um, you don't need to worry about cold moist stratification because they're going to actually go outside in the winter. They're gonna be out there the whole winter. Um, seeds germinate most successfully in cool soil. You'll have that as well. Um, but some of these other things to really get the germination going because nature has, uh, has created a system whereby some plants, they don't germinate right on, on cue. <laughs> They're not like our vegetables that we, we are pretty confident we, we plant those carrots and we're going to have germination uh, by a, a certain day, uh, et cetera. So these, and, and there are many, many different ways that plants have a, a adapted, uh, but some that you can wake them up uh, if you give them a hot water treatment. And that's typically bring, bring water to a boil and then take the pan off the stove and then put the seeds in there. And there are other mechanisms and guides on how to do that. Um, uh, D, seeds are very small and need light. And this is really important to know this for what we're doing today. Uh, another thing is you may think it's going to be, they're gonna start germinating and come up in the spring. Well, some plants say, no, I need another summer, and then I need uh, the winter, and then I need, uh, then I'll germinate in the spring. So, and, and as you can see, some, some seeds ne need uh, scarification, and all that is, uh, it's good uh, little blocks like this uh, with some fine sandpaper on it. Uh, a lot of our, um, our leguminous seeds, like our senna, in fact, this is center right here. Uh, they, they need, uh, they're, they've got a very thick seed coat and you just need to abrade that seed coat a little bit so that it allows the water to come in. Uh, sometimes they, uh, some of those uh, leguminous ones like Senna do okay uh, just going through the winter. The winter breaks it down, uh, but uh, the germination I've found isn't as good. Uh, anyway plant fresh and keep moist. There are other, other um, uh, uh, seeds that cannot dry out, okay? And this tells you that, meaning uh, especially our spring ephemerals, they need to be planted immediately. And you can use the same technique. Okay, so here are the, the, the materials. We've got, uh, we've got pots, of course. We need a good, uh, good compost-based uh, soil. Uh, you gotta think, okay, there are the, the, the potting, uh, the, the uh, propagation mediums for seeds, like for vegetables and everything. They may not be heavy enough to go through the winter uh, and, um, and then uh, to be potted up in the spring. They, uh, 
that, that they break down sometimes really uh, uh, quite a bit. So, and, and some of these, especially if you're doing a spring ephemeral that's got to go through the summer, winter, and then the next spring it uh, germinates, then it can be, uh, 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 it can break down. So just a good compost-based uh, potting soil. You need some seeds, you need some sand, you need some labels. One of the best ways uh, that I, I do uh, you can label with these garden markers by airline. airline. They do really terrific. Uh, there's also um, um, uh, just a pencil. And the beautiful thing about the pencil, it never goes away. It always stays on the plastic. Uh, it's plastic. I think it does okay on wood too, but I, I just have a lot of old plastic labels around that I use it. And then you can erase it too and reuse it, although sometimes these break down over the winter over you know, a, a, a certain time period. Um, you need a watering can, and you need something to protect uh, those pots from varmints. Uh, I've got soil up here, I've got pots, and I've got sand and everything. You're free to look at it. I think just to streamline things uh, and for uh, visual, uh, being able to see, uh, it might be better just to kind of walk you through it. So fill the pot to the rim. And you want to press it down. You don't want it too loosely compacted because that is going to settle. Uh, so, so just um, I, I, how I do it, Mr. Byerlang taught me this. You fill the pot to the top, and then you, 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 you uh, uh, just lightly you know, push it down. Some people use another pot. And, uh, but, uh, and then, uh, then uh, you sprinkle the uh, seed on top. Now that can vary according to how, what kind of materials the, 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 uh, the soil mix is. But nevertheless, uh, sprinkle your seed on top. And as you can see by this, uh, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty thick. You can typically, depending on the seed, but you can typically sow, sow 25, 50. Sometimes it's hard not to sow 100, 100 seeds. Uh, especially for small seeds. Um, you cover it with coarse sand. So I've got some sand here. Cover it to the depth of the thickness of the seed. And I'll talk more about that here in a minute. Label it. Make sure you label it. Every year there are a few things that are at least one thing. Maybe I think I'm getting better that haven't been labeled. Uh, push deep into the pot and then water. And then you provide protection. And the protection is just to keep rodents from getting in there and, and messing, messing things up. If they're a nut, um, then you've got to protect it. And you've got to almost industrially <laughs> protect it. Actually, you can just use, uh, uh, use the normal um, hardware cloth. It could be screens, too. A lot of people wonder why the, the sand uh, helps keep the seeds moist protects from hard rains. We've, we're getting these derechos, and, or however you pronounce it right now, and uh, it, you, you don't want that seed to just all flow over the side and everything. And, uh, and uh, the, the, the sand does seem to hold it in place better. Allows a little light in. Um, grittiness um, uh, of sand avoids surface caking. Probably not a huge issue, but nevertheless, uh, uh, that has been communicated to me. How to, use, how to use the sand. Not all seeds will, will need covering. Again, I showed that to you on the germination codes. It will tell you what seeds need covering and what don't, or uh, it tells you what seeds don't need covering. Um, and it's assumed that the others do. Yeah, like the really small seeds, especially the, the, our native lobelias, the great blue lobelia and the cardinal flower. Uh, cover seeds to the depth of the thickness of the seed. So if it's an acorn, you'd cover it about an inch. Uh, if it's um, the size of a, uh, of a uh, sunflower seed, a quarter of an inch, et cetera. And it, you don't have to measure it. It just, uh, just uh, uh, you can eyeball it, of course. And then protect it. Put it outside and protect it. And let the rains come. Let the snow come. Don't put it under the eaves of the house okay. uh, because you, you want that rain on it. You want that snow uh, and all. And it's best to put it outside in a shady area um, uh, because 
as the spring comes on, you, you can have hot days. And at that time, it's really critical that, that it doesn't dry out or you can, you can uh, kill the, the, the newly germinating uh, seeds. So let nature do its thing. Okay? I showed you those boxes. I made those. I've got directions uh, on how to do that. I do have, uh, I have a demonstration box here as well. Feel free to come up here. Like I said, I, I don't have boats, but I do things like this. Um, but this is just a very nice, <laughs> uh, some kid that was uh, 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 helping me with other stuff. Um, he, uh, um, he made this for me. And I uh, spent $120 on it, if you want to know. Um, but the main demonstration I want to show this to you, why I want to show this to you, is not only that it's a pretty fancy box, and you don't have to do this at all. Um, I have nine four-inch pots in there. So within a square foot, you could have nine species. And that, I think that means a lot. That's a, it just shows you, you can, you can grow a lot of plants. All right, and then, um, then come April, this was, uh, well, this was four or five years ago, but come April, you're starting to see some germination. Uh, then, um, um, then May, it's really starting to fill in. And I've got thousands of plants here, thousands, way more than I could ever put in my, my yard. Uh, uh, and uh, it most, it, and, but I, I, I do other things with plants, but, um, and then late June, you've got this, this mass of giant ironweed in this four inch pot. So uh, then as far as seedling handling, you, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, tease them apart uh, uh, and, uh, and put them individually into pots. For instance, right here, we've got Riddell's Goldenrod. We've, these are for the upcoming uh, MC Iris sale. Uh, so we, we wanted to put one plant per pot. At home, what I very often do, oh, by, by the way, this is, a, this is my last seedling, <laughs> seedling tray. Uh, I just sprinkled a few uh, um, 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 oh, little blue stem uh, grass in here and covered it and everything, but uh, uh, I, didn't, I didn't pot it up, and so now you can see it as a demo. Uh, but really, those should have been, I should have done something to them. At home, I more often than not, I do this. I do them in clumps. And, uh, and rather than individually put them into these little pots, I, uh, this is, uh, oh yeah, large flowered uh, it's, uh, uh, beard tongue. Anyway, it's a pinstamen. I, I put eight, 10 plants in an individual pot. So I took them from, from this mushroom tray and, uh, and then I made several of these. And, you, and, uh, and then, yes, question. So you said the best time for um, seeding out is between Thanksgiving and, and oh, yes, Christmas. Oh yes, I didn't mention that. Yes, um, I, I should have. Yeah. When's the when's the best time for collecting seeds? Well, it can vary. Uh, I've already collected probably about 40, 50 seeds, uh, even before right now. But this is really, really a key time. And as you'll see up here, all of these have been collected in the past few weeks. Um, and uh, and I, I really should have talked a bit about this, but uh, I, I may come back to that. Uh, but um, but uh, so it can really vary. Uh, but right now, you've got a lot of your summer, summer um, flowers that are going to seed. Your fall flowers are coming on, and they'll be later on, uh, October and so forth, your asters and things like that. Uh, but, uh, but it can vary. I collected a number of spring, pl uh, uh, spring, uh, spring uh, plants uh, this spring, uh, early summer uh, from the spring uh, that we've got at the conservation nursery that we're interested in. Uh, so it can vary. Yeah, it's a good question though. 
but a lot are coming on right now. And in fact, why don't I just mention it? We've, we've got up here uh, the seed collection, um, the um, Lake County Seed Collection Guide. Uh, it has various um, uh, uh, types of seeds. And so we've got the kind that are hitchhikers here. We've got like Joe Pie Weed, the fluffy ones. We've got shakers, which all you got to do is just turn them upside down and shake them, and then you get, get the seeds out. Most of them, it looks like they've fallen on the paper. You got your berries, you got your beaks. These are um, wild, uh, wild blue iris, and kind of they're in the shape of a beak, and they, they just uh, usually drop out. Uh, Pinstamens are that way. You've got your crumbly cone heads, your gray, gray, uh, uh, gray cone head. Actually, that's a little bit not right in here. These are, but you can you can get a feel for that. And then you got your cone uh, cone heads, and then you got your shatterers, which are mainly your grasses. So please look at that uh, before you go. But anyway, you know, let me go back to this, and then at the end, uh, you can. Uh, uh, in the fall, you can just plant these as a clump, or you can tease them apart and plant several clumps. So it's a lot easier that way. This is uh, another example. It's just a larger growing plant. Uh, and uh, this is the center I mentioned earlier. So I just put it, uh, put it in uh, several of them in a big pot. Yes? Yeah. So if I'm reading seed packages, it'll have to tell me to plant them in the clumps. Oh, uh, right. yeah. It would just ignore that and plant them in the clumps. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I mean, when you look at nature, those plants are all growing. They, they take up every available space. And if, uh, if you want a lot of mulch, you can do that. But, um, but it's, it's OK. They, they can grow together. Uh, and uh, uh, so, yeah. If, you, if they're something that spreads really well, uh, not usually an individual plant, but maybe they do by rhizomes, yeah, I'll give them a little, little bit of space. Uh, but, but no, you, you don't have to. Uh. All right, so quickly, a few resources. A any questions at all about the process? I've got all the materials up here. I'll be here for a few minutes if you want to look at them and ask questions about that. Uh, I think I've covered everything up here. So resources. Yeah, we have one question. Oh, yes. I actually have two questions. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, so please. first of all, is there, would you ever water, if it's, if it's like not a snowy winter, would you ever water? Uh, yes, good point. Uh, so on those, it depends on how much moisture you get through the winter. But if you notice that the sand looks like it's really drying out, uh, it, it's gone from a, uh, you know, a wet look to a real dry look, it, it's OK to provide a little water. Okay. Uh, especially though, in, in the spring, as I mentioned, you've got to watch to make sure that they don't dry out. Okay. So it's better to leave them a little bit moist. Um, and uh, any, any of you, well, I was going to ask a question about, well, let me ask it. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you, you, some of you maybe have heard of sowing in jugs. It's a form of winter sowing and, and everything. I know for me, I've, I've done that in the past, and I had to be really careful in the spring uh, because it's like a little greenhouse in there, and that, that is nice. It kind of gives you plants a little bit earlier, but you do have to watch out that they don't dry out too much. And, and the same, same thing you can have in a germination station, too. Um, my other question was a specific seed gathering question about yeah. ironweed. Ironweed. Okay. Yeah. How do you, what kind of, what, how do you collect the seeds from ironweed? All you got to do is just pull them off. They're, they're blooming right now. I've been talking yeah. about seed collecting. They're blooming like right now. So yeah. do you wait till I've been like, Yeah, you wait till they, they start getting fluffy, and then you can just shake them, just shake them into a bag. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you can bend bend it over and shake them into the bag. And uh, I didn't mention this. Uh, it's more in, when you're really focusing on sowing. But that fluff, uh, don't, worry about, oh, don't worry about it. You can plant those seeds with the fluff on them. Okay? Uh, when you get them, you get, you get seed without the fluff. Now, there are techniques with, uh, 
with the, uh, uh, the milkweed. Unfortunately, for demonstration purposes, this isn't quite ready. It's starting to get gray uh, and, 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 and it'll brown more. Uh, and then it should start almost splitting or, uh, before you would collect it. But like with a milkweed, you can open it up, not all the way. Uh, you don't, it's easier not to collect them when all the fluff is flying out. Okay, it's, it's just a, a big mess. Um, but you can collect them. You can kind of hold the fluff and then scrape the seeds off. Uh, and uh, there's, uh, uh, on our Facebook, uh, Chris Fox from Sycamore Land Trust, uh, he did a demo, so you can search that on our Facebook group if you're on Facebook. A lot of materials, uh, is that helpful? Okay. Uh, a lot of materials on our Native Plant Society's website. Okay, we've got other resources. Uh, we've got our uh, a Trello board. I don't know if any of you have ever worked with Trello, any of you? Uh, but it, it's pretty slick for this kind of stuff. So we can put a lot of information about the presentations and, and other stuff. Uh, we've got bios up there. And uh, we just started this in January, but uh, uh, it's got a lot of materials. Uh, uh, Jillian Harris, um, uh, local illustrator, author, uh, she's been doing all these uh, special communications on seed stuff. And then we've got our two flyers on there that you can actually pull up digitally if you'd like. And, and I've got those over there. Uh, upcoming events. I mentioned our um, uh, Indiana Native Plant Society's annual convention. It's going to be right here at our convention center. Uh, we do have our seed swap. I mentioned the uh, seed containers there, and that'll be during the day, uh, during the breaks for the uh, event. Uh, I mentioned also that we do a monthly presentation, and Ray Major, have any of you heard of Ray Major? Yeah, good. He's, uh, he's actually local. He lives in Elm Heights neighborhood. And Ray has a, a, uh, uh, a Facebook page called Trees from Seed. Uh, he's a retired forester, etc. He's going to be talking about acorns and oaks, propagating oaks. He's a specialist in direct seeding. We're doing it in pots here, but he focuses, especially, and he primarily works with woodies. Uh, woody type of plants from you know the tree, trees in the title, uh, but he, uh, uh, but nevertheless he does all direct seeding. We've got social media I mentioned. Uh, we've got about 2,300 people on the Facebook group, and uh, we've got an Instagram account, not as active there. Uh, typically we put together some guide guides on. Uh, Growing natives from seed. In this case, it's blood blood root. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, kind of talking about what we were talking about before. Is it ever uh, if you if you collect seeds too early, right? So we uh -huh. we had blue lobelia and it, uh, the winds like last week knocked over a stem uh -huh. and it, it went to seed. Yeah. Um, do you have less germination rate? Because it, it doesn't look ready yet. Yeah. Is it worth it to still try and collect the seeds? It, you, can, you can put them in a, in a plate yeah. uh, or, you know, on a, uh, you know, in a container and, you know, exposed to the air and everything and see if they'll mature more. But if they're, um, if, uh, and, and what you can do, uh, I, I'm sure um, you said it's great blue lobelia. Yeah. Uh, you can look it up in here. Okay. We'll look it up before you leave, just sure, to sure. see see if compare it to what your seed looks like. Yeah. yeah. And if it's uh, in that case, it should be kind of a black brown. I, are they still green? Yeah, they, they, they're a little green. <laughs> okay. they're, they're they're right in the middle of turning. It's okay. Beautiful okay. stock. They but. may they probably won't. Now some yeah. some seeds will will uh, uh, you can pick them you can uh, 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 collect them a little bit early. Some will uh, go ahead and, uh, and mature, um, just laying out on a counter, uh, but uh, uh, it, it depends. Yeah, it depends on the species. 
and not everybody, people don't always know which ones they are, but there are, uh, uh, that's one of the good things. Unfortunately, they don't have this here, at least uh, we didn't uh, the last time uh, when I looked about a year ago, but uh, some of these books, I think I've got a, another one over there uh, that uh, they kind of tell you if you can collect them early or not. Okay, when, at what stage to collect them. And actually, the Lake County Seed Collection Guide gives you some of that information too. So, yeah, good question though. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Do you have any advice on how you can carry out like the stratification process indoors? So I, I live in an oh, apartment, I can't, I, yeah. I don't have like yard space. Um, yeah. So if you've got like any tips or tricks for yeah, know, absolutely. Them in a bag or keeping uh, absolutely. Them moist in the I, uh, I haven't gone into to that really. Um, the um, what I'm what am I looking? Oh, I know what I'm looking for. So Prairie Moon Nursery again. I have actually got one of the germination codes. I brought it, um, and uh, in here, it gives you. Uh, here, I'll pass that back to you, but it shows you I think a couple of methods in there. And you can get that online too. That, that's all on their website. Uh, what, one of the methods, so what he's asking, in case someone is not familiar with this, um, but you, you can actually, for those, let me go back, and see if I can find it. It might make more sense. Okay, right there. Uh, Okay, so, so it says no pretreatment. You can just plant those, and if it's warm, uh, nights and days, it'll, it'll, it'll germinate. It'll, you'll start growing plants. But others, like for the sea uh, moist stratification, then you can actually do that artificially in, in a refrigerator. So you can do it with, there are various methods. You could do it with coffee filters keeping those moist, fold them over the seeds, putting them in into a plastic bag, airtight, and putting them into your fridge, uh, you know, like down in your, down in your, uh, uh, your vegetable drawer or whatever. Uh, you can also do that as well with sand. In fact, Prairie Moon Nursery will sell, sell you some sand. <laughs> so, but you don't, you don't need to buy that. Uh, uh, a good mix is half vermiculite, half sand. Uh, if you're familiar with vermiculite, uh, and uh, but you could just use sand. I've used sand many times, uh, and you can you can put those then into a plastic bag, moist. Uh, it should kind of hold its position, but not wet because you don't want to rot them out. But um, so you've got the sand in here; it's moistened, and it should stay in a little bit of a ball. And you know you mix your seeds with that, uh, and then. Uh, uh, and then put them in there for the amount of time that uh, Prairie Moon Nursery guides you on. Uh, but they've got all that guidance on how to do that in their, on their, uh, the website. Good question. Yeah, that works, works really well. I mean, um, most professional growers, I shouldn't say mo most professional growers, but, uh, well, I would probably most professional growers do that with their native plants. Uh, now, uh, if they're more niche, like uh, conservation nursery, like we have at Sycamore Land Trust, Nasami Farm, et cetera, which they probably do some of that too. But, but yeah, great question. Yes. I have problems with damping off from soil quality. It just starts, it just rots down at the ground. Yeah, and and that is when you're uh, stratifying them in the fridge. Uh, oh, 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 the seeds. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe, uh, maybe they're too moist. Or now, you're not growing them in a greenhouse, right? No. That's a usual issue with greenhouse. Um, I've tried using the fans, and the fans blowing across. Yeah, the seem to help. To help. Yeah, yeah. Once it gets started, it's real hard to, yeah. to save everything. Yeah. Um, that's usually a, a less of an issue. I've, I don't have issues in a greenhouse I did all the time. Uh, so uh, maybe we can. Well, that I am in the house. My, oh, 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 house. oh! That's why you're not doing them outside right. like this method. Um, yeah, that's hard to control. Uh, I, I, yeah. 
sorry. I, I, was, I was thinking, well, it was outside. And that's a good thing about this method. You don't have issues with fungus or any of those damping off kind of issues uh, in there, out there. Yes? We have a variety of pots, but you were talking about outside and doing like in the covered right. protected area. Yeah. Can, how deep of a pot do you recommend? Because uh, I've got the four inch like those type, but if I wanna do a whole bunch, can you use like those two inch trays or is that too shallow? You can, you can. You'd have to pot them off pretty quickly though. Okay. Uh, or you would need to move them up pretty quickly. Um, I, one of my favorites are the, the mushroom containers you get from Blooming Foods. And uh, you of course have to put some holes in the bottom, uh, but, uh, uh, but they're free. But you do want some depth, uh, uh, but, but that works too. A lot of people actually do that. They'll put them in uh, these plug, plug uh, flats. It takes up a lot of room, uh, and, uh, and they, uh, they, they, they grow them in there just fine. But again, you won't be able to, this method, Typically, you're going to have to uh, divide them up in the spring sometime. And then this is a fall planting method, as I kind of showed you, I think. Yes? Uh, would there be any reason not to use, like, the kind of plastic clamshells that wasp lettuce comes no. in? That no. No. In fact, uh, uh, if you're familiar with Radovan Hajek, uh, U.S. perennials outside of town, uh, Rod, he does everything. I've noticed in like lettuce containers and everything. At least he did a bunch of his stuff that way in his greenhouse. Yeah, they're free. Oh, well, they're not free, but, but they're, uh, yeah. yeah, you got them. And at least you feel like you're recycling something. Okay, any other comments or questions? All right, well, thanks. Uh, I've, um, you can get me at seed at indiananativeplants.org, uh, and uh, the information is on the, uh, on the flyers. You can get me there, or yeah, you're welcome to come on Facebook if you're not on our, in our group. Anyway, thanks all. Thank you. Uh -huh. <clears throat>